Pronto. JP, is that your picture there with? Yep. Yep. Any questions, any commentary, any whatevers before we get started? All right, day one of alcohol. And well, I think we'll, we can probably do it in two days. So we'll, we'll start with the history and context of, of alcohol, and then we'll talk about the metabolism of alcohol today. And then we'll get into some of the stress responses and, and sort of peripheral physiology of, of alcohol interactions on Friday. So chat box is open. I assume everybody can see. And, you know, again, so we'll start with just some commentary. I'm not really holding people accountable for the commentary piece, for the history piece, for the, the um, little profundity piece and, and all that. But um, so there's a few books that are decent on alcohol and its history and its, its, its contexts. And, and from today, a lot of the material is going to come from here, um, these three. This one, not that good. Drunken Botanist is the best sounding title of the three. Um, and it's sort of the least enjoyable and least academic and, and whatever, interesting of the three. It's, it, I think she recently, the author, I think she recently had read Richard Dawkins's ancestor's tale and was trying to tell a story of comparable grandeur and 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 magnificence and and but did, didn't you know, like when you when you read a, a wikipedia page what you end up seeing is every possible piece of information and nobody has um, curated that information to say, okay, this is worth reading. This isn't really worth reading. This is interesting. This isn't interesting. And so you just sort of shove in every possible detail and, and hope that means their grandeur will follow. And, and Oscar Wilde had this really great line about um, to paint what you see is a good rule in art, but to see what's worth painting is better, right? And that's where that's where this book, this this bottom one, sort of fails. Is she doesn't really necessarily see what's worth painting. She's just, she has good taste in gin, and then puts in a lot of recipes. And I'm sure some of those recipes are good, but but the information about alcohol is a little bit sparse. But there are a few things that I've taken from that book for this. Um, History of the World in Six Glasses. This one, this is pretty good. Uh, it's it is. There's no depth to it, but the breadth is all is all very good. It just doesn't sort of plumb the it sort of plums the shallows of of an interesting narrative, and and some of those glasses are are alcohol. Um, very little pointlessness and few surprises. It's, it's not bad. This top one though, proof. This is this is a good book, um, Adam Rogers, and sort of that Goldilocks space between history of the world and six glasses with with good shallows, and the drunken botanist with sort of pointless depth. This one sort of uh, recognizes when it is appropriate to to thrust in details of of what those are when those are invited. But those three books, there's, there's a lot are, is going to come from that. So alcohol, when, when we're talking about the discovery and incorporation of alcohol into contemporary society in our mouths and, and in the, the mouths of all, of all society, um, what we see is, is 
a bunch of residue on pots on, on sort of primitive pottery some clay and sand and whatever and so a bunch of fragments of 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 pottery and this residue of alcohol on it nine thousand years ago ten thousand years ago eleven thousand years ago in this range these are the really old relics and remnants of of alcohol in society and and from iraq from from iran from turkey um, some some really old stuff from Turkey, from France up there, and, and China over there. We have we have some of these these uh, remnants to say, okay, historically, old people from old civilizations were putting a bunch of food in pots and noticing that some magic sauce is is going to develop in there, and then it, whatever it gets preserved on those things. So. The Sumerians, sort of the classic story of you know Mesopotamia, whatever uh, the the Sumerians. Um, there are some. This is where Gilgamesh. You all know, like Gilgamesh was. Oh, like today we we talk about what what are this like mansplaining and stuff like that. These, these terms of of. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to be like insensitive, but you know, you know all the sort of um, psychosocial um sociological gender studies types of of terms for uh masculinity and to to toxic masculinity and all that stuff gilgamesh man that guy that would I, 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 there should be a class today on like toxic masculinity and you just read gilgamesh um 2100 bc this is this is the oldest book of the sort of of celebrated um the earliest surviving uh, celebrated literature is, is is Gilgamesh. Before Gilgamesh, all we really had for writing was like recipes for you know alcohol. <laughs> you know, it's, it, we have these. There's there's evidence that the pyramids were not built with slaves. It was built with with people who were paid on rations of you know beer and bread, and you can totally hydrate on beer. Uh, you know, we talked about that uh, earlier where when we were looking at these hydration uh, index, um, you know, coffee and, and beer and stuff like that, you can hydrate off this. So the, historically, the world, we, we weren't really drinking water throughout history. I mean, it was mostly just poison. You know, water is just a bunch of, of like swampy bacteria in the water and get amoebic dysentery and shit yourself into the grave. I mean, that's what water was. And so you boil it and you might as well throw a tea bag in there. You might as well make some alcohol. There's a lot of things humanity has been drinking for forever. But when we start looking at, at sort of early recorded history, um, we're seeing a lot of these tablets with, with you know, instructions for you know, payment and alcohol, stuff like that. And the earliest identified pot uh, so far to date that anybody has found with alcohol residue, residue on it was Turkey, sort of that most northern of the Middle East about 11,000 years ago. So malt, maybe barley um, is going into this. And then, and then those carbohydrates are going to get uh, a little bit weird, right? And so people know people didn't know what was causing this. People didn't know the reason alcohol, what fermentation really was, and what was causing it, and how to control it. But for the longest time, human history, all the whole like living animal kingdom, was just participants in nature, trying not to die, right? The environment, as we talked about in lectures, you know, one through whatever. Mother Nature is not this loving, compassionate, sort of warm bosomed um, uh, maternal figure, right? It is this callous, usually frigid, let's die of hypothermia, punishing force that seems so much more interested in exterminating the species that inhabit the earth than protecting and promoting them. And so we have been long, long, long been participants uh, in nature, but we weren't um, we weren't tinkering, right? We 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 weren't intervening, and then eventually, some of the earliest, yeah, sure, we start building, we're erecting monuments, and you know, building a you know, here's a teepee and here's a wall and whatever. But but when when you look at distillation and alcohol and, and all this, this is really when we start designing and intervening uh, in nature, and so the origin. Of, of alcohol, not just the discovery of here's a pot with some residue on it, but in China, right, it's rice, it's honey, it's grapes, maybe some hawthorn. Um, 
And people would just put these whole things in, these whole substrates, these whole products, just throw them all into the pot and wait. And it, sometimes it gets weird, right? Sometimes it gets weird. And then sometimes it feels weird. You put it in your mouth and then suddenly it, it starts to feel weird. Okay, yay, magic, right? So that's all we really had uh, was just throw all this stuff into a pot and, and, and let's hope the magic happens. Uh, Rene Descartes, he, his thoughts on reproduction were fascinating. He thought, um, and it really, it illustrates the importance of alcohol to civilization. His thought that children are born from fermentation, right? Descartes says like, you know, children are, are the, the product of fermentation. It's like men and women, you just like the semen ferments. And then lo and behold, we have, we have kids. And so this is a nice illustration of how important alcohol has been to us, a fermentation that gives us a nice buzz and it even gives us our offspring. I mean, this is, this is how, how central to civilization uh, it has been. It's not just like the frat party, right? I mean, this is all civilization. And when, when you hear about the Descartes stuff, sometimes it makes me question the rest of what he had to say. I mean, critical figure and, and you know, philosophy. And, but whenever I hear something that hilarious, uh, and one has to excuse him because nobody you know, understood science back then, but uh, it, it, there's, there's in alcohol, uh, long my been my favorite importer is Kermit Lynch. He's in uh, Berkeley and he takes a bunch of French, mostly French uh, wine, some Italian in there. And, and it avoided the Californianization of, of wine, which is um, uh, tons of alcohol, higher percentage of alcohol than there should be, because you capitalize, you th throw a bunch of sugar in there and allow that sugar to ferment in addition to the natural sugar that exists in the in the grapes. We need to get a fruit bomb, right? This thing needs to explode in my mouth. I need like 15 and a half percent alcohol in this thing and it still needs to be sweet. And whatever. okay, throw a bunch of sugar in there as it's fermenting, right? That's not just grapes to get to, get to that. Um, and then let's just throw some bark chips in it too because oh it's aged in like oak casks or whatever i ah, i just it tastes like i crashed on the like a little kid's playground going down the slide and i got like bark chips in my mouth and stuff and so but this like oh it tastes like wood and there's and it's so sweet and there's a million percent alcohol and everything like, yeah, whatever this, this is the robert parker model of of wine and it sort of took over most of the world if if you go to like a is barnes and noble the one that closed and borders is left or is it the other way around Order. Which one still exists? I don't know if anything exists now. It's like quarantine outside. Whichever one exists. Let's say Barnes and Noble is the one that still exists. Um, so you go to a Barnes and Noble and you go to like the wine section and you're looking at all the books and everything. Robert Parker, all those huge coffee table books, he's the one who wrote all of them. And I just thought he had horrible taste in wine. I mean, it was the fruit bomb stuff. I was just like, this is the worst tasting thing in the world. Why does anybody think this is good? And, but he invented the point system. Um, this is a hundred point wine. This is a 96 point wine. This is an 81 point wine. This wine doesn't have a point because it is so bad according to Robert Parker's taste. And you know, there's the wine spectator and the wine advocate and these, these, these periodicals. And, and, uh, and so he came up with the first one and, and the publication and everybody, the whole world started catering to his taste, except for Kermit Lynch. She's like, no, I'm, I'm importing the wines that don't do that. that I'm the, I'm the anti Robert Parker. And he wasn't nearly as, as famous, but he's just in Berkeley and, and is pretty renowned. But then at one point, Kermit Lynch decided to really go forward with a jazz band that's called Kitty Fur, not like, children for but like you know kitty cat whatever for and i it was just the whole thing was weird and embarrassing and like i've never bought one of his you know bottles since uh now because i question his wine taste i'm like you know maybe i was wrong about him all the all these years um but I, it's that same thing with whenever I hear something insane, um, you know, Descartes, like, oh, kids are born, you know, it's not the stork d delivering this, it's like the booze that delivers the babies, uh, you know, babies are born from booze, it's a, it's a fermentation. Now, fermentation, we're talking yeast here, right, this isn't what you're doing, you, in your cells, you are not doing glycolysis and ending with ethanol. You, you are not doing glycolysis, um, clear to ethanol, and then just getting drunk on, on your sugar cubes or like, you know, uh, Skittles. Who needs the Skittles and the vodka? I've got Skittles and I'm just going to convert them clear into ethanol. 
um, we go through glycolysis and you know, we're going to get lactate, um, maybe acetyl-CoA. It, it, it depends on, on what we're going to do with our pyruvate, right, when we go through this. And, and when we go through glycolysis, a lot of what we start with is actually not glucose. So hexokinase, that first step in, in glycolysis, that's only if you're going from glucose um, to get G6P, glucose 6-phosphate. That's the only time you use hexokinase. Now, that's what yeast is going to do because yeast is going to work on sugar. Um, not complex carbs. Now, there's some symbiotic relationships where, where the yeast can uh, work on the sugar and something else can work on the complex carbs. Or, but, but we do a lot of glycogen. Uh, we metabolize a lot of glycogen. You know, we have a pound of the stuff, maybe 350 grams, give or take. You know, it depends on your size. It depends on your conditioning, um, history of exercise, you know, how much you weigh when you step on the scale, what your diet looks like. There's a lot of variables are going to come into how much carbohydrate you have on board. But let's say you have 350 grams, you know, 454 in a, in a pound. Let's say you have have 350 or so in your skeletal muscle. You got another 100 grams or so in your liver, and your liver is really helping maintain your blood sugar or something. I mean, you have a pound of glycogen on board. You got a full pound of this stuff. Blood sugar, you got like four grams of that stuff, four to five uh, grams of, of blood sugar. And so what you're going to use, you know, go exercise, get on that treadmill, pick up a dumbbell, you're exercising. What are you going to use metabolically? We're going to use glycogen. If you're consuming glycogen, do you go through hexokinase? No, you skip that step. Um, you go through glycogen phosphorylase and phosphoglucomutase. You get your G6P. You haven't consumed any ATP. Now, if you're yeast, though, if you're yeast, which is what we often study in, in bio classes when we're talking about metabolism, you do this, but what you end up with is ethanol. You don't end up with uh, lactate or, or acetyl-CoA, whatever, whatever you do with the pyruvate. At the end, if you're yeast, you're going to wind up with your ethanol. Um, so it's a little bit different, and I don't think we should be using yeast to talk about metabolism in the human form in like a bio class or something. But in if we're, if we're understanding the context of this as yeast, that's part of my issue with taking um, biology as opposed to human physiology. And, and there's, there's sometimes there isn't a context. You know, what are we talking about? What's the creature that we're in? I mean, is this like aquatic life? Are we in outer space? Um, is this like a bunny's colon? Are we in yeast? What, is this ET? You know, what are we talking about here? And it's because the human body doesn't often uh, behave identically to how, you know, some, some quadruped or, or, you know, bacteria or whatever would. Now, from the, from the Adam Rogers book, Proof, sugar, this is, it's a great passage, so I just plugged the whole thing in here. Sugar is the most important molecule on earth. And I, I agree with him here, you know, in, the, in that people talk about water. I mean, you listen to like, I don't know, an astrophysicist or, or something saying like, all right, we're looking for some planet, you know, does it have water? You know, does Mars have water there somewhere? And, and you know, let's look at, I don't know, the Jupiter moons. Um, is there water in these things? Oh, is there ice and whatever? Like, okay, fine. Yeah, sure. Water is a really important molecule, right? But it's the medium. And that's what he talks about here is it's, it's the medium. Um, the most important molecule is really going to be sugar. Um, and so the, the example he gives is like, okay, what is the best book ever written? To which I would say the picture of Dorian Gray. But, but the equivalent of saying water is like paper, Paper is the best book ever written. Well, no, what are you talking about? You have to have words on the page for it to be of, of, of some value. And, and that's really what water is, is, is paper on which we can write the story of life. And sugar is so important. It's what it's, I mean, that, like ribose is sugar. And that's, that's the backbone of your DNA and all your metabolism. The, the, you know, sugar is fuel, it's a gas in our tanks. And, and so in yeast, the fermentation of that sugar um, is how, again, we're going to get to ethanol. Um, 
now alcohol dehydrogenase that we're going to talk about that in us at the end of the at the end of today um, we're going to talk about how we metabolize that ethanol so yeast shits this stuff out right it eats sugar and 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 sort of you know kicks out its its ethanol and then we drink its feces and and then we use alcohol dehydrogenase to to break it down um, so the reasons, though, the why here, remember how questions are mechanisms. How is, what is the mechanism behind whatever, you know, uh, how, how does glycolysis work? Well, this enzyme catalyzes this reaction, and these are the um, you know, substrates and the products, and then uh, what, you know, so those are how questions are mechanisms. Why questions are purpose. And so why does yeast spit out ethanol. Why does this happen? It's a fascinating question to which we don't have an answer, but it's reasonable to speculate. It's reasonable to exercise a little bit of curiosity. And, and so you know, let's, let's get, let's anthropomorphize yeast. Let's, let's put human emotion and, and um, incentives and, uh, into yeast. So maybe the yeast is celebrating. Um, uh, a few of you had an ACSM abstract ex uh, accepted and, and maybe there's a celebratory drink that'll happen or a Friday comes around you're like, Ooh, I made it through another week. I'm going to celebrate. Sure. All right. Maybe the, if we can anthropomorphize yeast and say, maybe they're unwinding at the end of a day with it, with a shot and they just, they make their own shot. They, they do their own labor. Maybe chemistry just demands that that's how this works. There is no other way. Right. So, so uh, there's no, way to to have metabolism work and just the laws of the universe and so yeast was was forced to develop this tolerance and and go through it um maybe this one's a little bit more believable ethanol uh is yeast's sulforaphane or tobacco or caffeine it's 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 this combating its enemies Right. Okay. So there's sugar here, and I want to eat all this sugar. I want nobody else to have this sugar, and so I'm going to eat it, and I'm just going to shit out a bunch of poison that's going to kill any other uh, predators for this sugar. You know, I, I want my my uh, ethanocide or wh whatever competitor aside. You know, if, if if some predator goes and kills an animal and there's the carcass there then the other predators start coming in to try to share in the feast and then has to fight them off and you see the same thing elsewhere um i mean that's what cheese essentially is is like all right i'm just gonna i'm gonna create a bunch of like weird shit um so that to try to to try to uh, you know I'm, I'm gonna spit on it so that nobody else wants it that's essentially like the making of cheese maybe that's what ethanol is it's it's yeast marking its territory um it's possible that uh, there's a dissipation of byproducts. When you're looking at the, the rate of evaporation, ethanol evaporates really effectively. Just put hand sanitizer on or like an alcohol swab or something. You know, go get your hands in water, dip your hands in water, and then dip your hands in alcohol. And which one evaporates faster? That ethanol is gone in a hurry. And then your hands are like super dry and, and you need some sort of lubricant for them at some point. So maybe it's it's a dissipation of byproducts. Uh, that That's a possibility. Maybe there's something else. I don't know the why, but, but contemplating of why do we have alcohol? It's such a weird compound. And so why do we have it? But okay, so first off, what is yeast? This is a thing that's giving us our alcohol, that's giving us our booze, our beers and wines, our, our distilled our liquors and whatever. Is, you know, we're, we're beginning with, with a bunch of yeast, the metabolism of yeast. And so it's a fungus, right? These yeasts, these things are, are, are they're, they're, it's a fungus and they reproduce asexually. So if you look at these little, um, I don't know if that's disgusting or cute or whatever. These little green zits right here. These, these, are, these are daughter cells sort of being born of, of, of brewer's yeast. These are, these are budding yeasts right here from asexual reproduction. 
And in studying this stuff, we have learned so much in the natural sciences about metabolism, how metabolism works, right? Just study yeast, uh, about genetics. Now, the fruit fly is also a, a worthy contender for, for what teaches us an awful lot about genetics. If you've, if you've taken a genetics class, and like there's a lot of fruit fly info. And certainly alcohol, pretty much everything we know ever about alcohol is, is, has yeast has been our, our professor of, of, of that discipline. But remember that yeast eats sugar. It doesn't dine on complex carbs in the way that we do. You know, uh, glycogen, right? We have glycogen phosphorylase and then phosphoglucomutase. And, and then we shove G6P into um, our glycolysis. And that's the bulk of our glycolytic, our carbohydrate metabolism is going to be, during exercise at, at least, is, is going to be through... Um, glycogenolysis as opposed to through uh, you know, just using glucose will actually backwardly inhibit hexokinase. During exercise, we suppress hexokinase activity. We suppress sugar metabolism during exercise because if we didn't we die uh you know if if you get hypoglycemic goodbye you certainly goodbye central nervous system function your central nervous system is not going to touch fat it'll certainly it'll be happy with ketones and you can make ketones out of fat but that's a slightly different metabolic conversation um so but yeast uh it eats sugar right not complex carbs yeast eats sugar um but the the estimates you know i wasn't around 150 million years ago so i can't like i didn't do this experiment and like walking around like oh there it is i found the yeast whatever but but what is assumed with with some scientific um maybe not certainty but scientific um uh i don't know like evidence you know, comp you know compelling evidence 150 million years ago or so but like sugar canes of grass and grasses weren't around then so probably the tree sap that's probably the foundation of of yeast is a bunch of of uh tree sap um and this is so ryan heights let's yeah. let's let's have this pronounced was there a question Pardon? Yeah. yeah, really quick. If you could um, explain the pictures of the yeast, what was that happening? Like I seen like a piece of it coming off on the last slide. Um, okay, hold on. Of the yeast. That oh, one. Was, yeah. Remember the, the asexual reproduction? Um, and so these sort of uh, yeah, budding daughter cells. Um, and so, so this is, it, it is not like, you know, a couple of primates get together and blend their genomes and, and so mommy and daddy make baby, you know, that's, that's not how yeast is going to reproduce. Um, there's an asexual reproduction with it. And so that, that's, you don't need to know that for any tests or anything, but that's, that's what the image is, is showing there. But Reinheitsgebot. Reinheitsgebot. There, I'll play it one more time. Whoops, I'll play zero more times apparently. But there it goes. Reinheitsgebot. Okay, so Reinheitsgebot. Um, this is the German uh, beer purity law from Bavaria, right? This is um, southeastern, the eastern side of southern uh, Germany. And what this law said, if, let's get serious about beer here. What this law said, the only ingredients that were allowed in the production of beer were barley, hops, and water. That's it. Nothing else. Okay, so what are we missing here in the list of ingredients? Well, you cannot make it without yeast, and yeast is nowhere to be found in this in this list of, of, of ingredients. And so you know, in, the, in the 16th century, people didn't quite know how this, uh, how this works. But um, this is Brussels over here. So we're, we're in Belgium and, and um, in Southwestern uh, 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 Belgium, we have what is my favorite beer is the you know, Lambic beer, it, super low alcohol percentage, but, but this is made uh, through spontaneous fermentation, which means they don't add brewer's yeast. Um, it's wheat, it's barley, it's hops, and they don't deliberately add any uh, yeast. It's wild yeasts find their way in and you get spontaneous fermentation. And you get a slightly different um, 
uh, alcohol that way, but it's going to be yeast getting in there. It's not let's just throw in um, the ingredients and hope those ingredients uh, manage to do all the work themselves. And so, you know, any successful fermentation, any fermentation where you're actually going to get some ethanol in it, and we'll talk about the difference between ethanol and methanol, but any, any successful uh, fermentation, um, you get this, you know, little haze, this condensation out of the liquid, and gist, uh, that's what the word yeast comes from, is gist. So when you talk about, uh, give me the gist of what you know, you know, let's just, no, oh, what was the gist of the presentation or of the book or of the content, the lecture, whatever, the gist of it, that's what yeast, the root word uh, comes from. So literally boiling it down to the gist or the yeast, it's really found its way into contemporary vernacular in the same way, like the humors, you know, how we killed George Washington, for example, 1799, December, almost about 1800. Um, was oh let's balance his humors let's get rid of like 40 percent of his blood and, and but even like in the in the language of the humors we have like oh this is a dry wine you know or let's let's blend humors and 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 yeasts here and this is a dry wine it is a fluid it is wet wine is a liquid now you can buy powdered wine just go to amazon and type powdered wine and you can buy that that is a dry wine there's no such thing as a dry wine um that's that's conversation about other than powdered wine if it's if it's a liquid form it's in a bottle and it has a cork in it that's wet that's a fluid that is not dry that is the opposite of dry um and so that's uh, a description of the humors right so, so this kind of old kind of medical vernacular um Antoine Lavoisier, second half of the 18th century, 1700s, right? Second half. This is the guy, really important figure. This is the guy. Well, first off, he's, he's really important in chemistry and, and physiology. He's the guy who named oxygen. Antoine Lavoisier named oxygen. Now, oxygen means acid maker right, oxygenesis, whatever, acid maker. But hydrogens, that's acid, right? We know this because a pH, the power, the potency, potential, whatever, the P of hydrogen, that's your acidity, hydrogen. And so oxygen, acid maker, that really, I guess, should be the name for, for hydrogen. So he got that a little bit wrong. He also named uh, hydrogen, which is water maker, you know, hydrogenesis, water maker. These aren't particularly good names, hydrogen and oxygen and stuff, even if they have a nice mouth feel, you know, the sound, the cadence, whatever, what your you know, tongue and lips are doing. The, the names themselves aren't, aren't very good. Smart guy, though. Everybody else in his era and all of the eras that preceded him, everybody else was taking whole foods and just throwing them in and seeing what happens, right? All right, let's let's just get the cantaloupe and the the kind of you know barley and just just throw everything in there. Put the bees in there with the honey. And it's just just get everything in there and, and let's see what happens. And this is the guy who figured out that it wasn't the whole package that matters. This is the guy who figured out there is a chemical compound in this stuff that is the ingredient, not the ingredients like we need a whole cantaloupe or whatever. There, this is, there is an ingredient for ethanol creation and it is sugar, right? And he's the guy who figured this out where sugar has carbon in it, you know, usually six, right? There's, there's this, this show, I mean, if you get into you know, ribose or whatever, even five, but, but usually we're, we're looking at six carbon sugars. <clears throat> Ethanol has sugar in it. When you put a bunch of sugar here in, in some vat or pot or, 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 you know, whatever dish and allow it to ferment, you wind up with a bunch of carbon, but the composition of that carbon has changed. You now have less sugar and you have a bunch more ethanol. So he, this is the guy who started to figure out what fermentation is. Following fermentation, we see a difference in the compounds that hold that carbon. Um, so, you know, getting near the 19th century, end of the 18th century, he publishes his first paper here and talking about the amount of, of carbon 
uh, that's in this stuff. And fast forward the world just a little bit more, and he's executed. Right? So the French Revolutionary government, they chop his head off. And then France after that offers a kilo of gold. I mean, this is just like nine years after they execute the guy who understands more than anybody you know, known to live at this point through from the beginning of hominid history until 1794. Antoine Lavoisier was the alcohol guy, singularity. This was the guy who understood alcohol. And uh, they chopped his head off. And then nine years later, they're like, oh shit, we got to figure out how fermentation works. We, we, we got to start controlling this. We really have to start uh, manipulating this. And there's a market here and we all want to be wasted and whatever. And so they offer a kilo, you know, over two pounds of gold to somebody who can demonstrate how fermentation works. Nobody did because they just beheaded the guy who who could have answered that. Now, 1837 comes around and and let's go into Germany and, and Schwann, right? We know the word Schwann should be should carry some familiarity from a Schwann cell, right? So in nerves, the, uh, you have a myelin sheath, right? We have this thing called saltatory conduction, where it's very fast uh, nerve conduction velocity if the nerve is myelinated. So if we're talking about pain fibers, nociceptors, you know, we have type C nociceptors where there's no myelin and the nerve conduction velocity is very slow. We have a delta, which has thin myelin. Nerve conduction velocity is a lot faster, but it's not like, you know, a Ferrari or anything. Um, it's like Usain Bolt or something, and as opposed to merely walking, you know, you're, you're out for a leisurely stroll. There's your, there's your unmyelinated fibers. Um, a alpha, a beta, thick myelin, and those things, that's like your kind of cruising along in a little, you know, jet, <laughs> or at least like a crop duster plane or, you know, a Ferrari or something. Um, so Schwann, myelin was not the only thing, the Schwann cell, what, what produces the myelin sheath, that wasn't his only uh, contribution. He also coined the term metabolism, which like oxygen and hydrogen is really not that good of a term. It's okay. Metabolism is okay as, as, a, as a term. You know, we have catabolism, which means breakdown. Cata means down. It's like cataplexy or whatever. It means down. Bolism, like throw. It just means throw. Like you throw a ball, right? Bolism, whatever. And so you throw down. That's breakdown. That's catabolic stuff. Anna up, right? Anabolism. You're throwing stuff up, right? So that's build up, um, accumulation. Um, so anabolism up, catabolism down, metabolism after, meta after all that throwing, what do we have left? The summation of chemical reactions. Um, this is the guy uh, who came up with, with that too, but he's also uh, potentially more, potentially, I don't know, arguably, more important than those contributions was the identification of how this stuff works. Um, that, <sighs> we have yeast, right? And they're going to eat sugar and they're, they will shit out ethanol, the, the booze that, that we all drink and love so much and, and reproduce asexually. These are, this is, these are his discoveries, right? The zucca pills, or the sugar fungus. Um, like all brilliant ideas, like all really good ideas, uh, th people hated him. And they're like, nope, you are a fool. Right, you are you are an idiot, you know. Oh, please, little tiny creatures. Um, they eat sugar, they piss carbon dioxide, and they shit out booze. Please, Mr. Schwan cell. Um, so that was the response, but eventually we realized he was right. And all really good ideas start off this way. Nearly all. That's that's a little bit all encompassing, but so many of life's greatest ideas and advances and most progressive thinking starts off this way, where it's stupid and you're stupid. That's the response. That's the response society and society's biggest, loudest voices give you. It's that stupid and you're stupid. That's the initial response. And then experimentation and and the years of experimentation 
prove you right. At that point, everyone pretends like it was their idea all along and they believed you all along and oh, I had that idea before he did. And that's what happened to uh, Schwann. That's, that's what happened to him as well. But he was the guy who came up with all this stuff. The Schwann cell guy came up with the idea that the A, these things reproduce asexually, but they're eating the sugar and shitting out alcohol. Um, and that's actually how it works. Now, Louis Pasteur, we all know this name. Uh, 1850s, this is pretty much pre-germ theory in the 1850s, pretty much. Now, there's you can say the germ theory was what had its roots. Uh, you know, it was the idea of, of, of germ theory was proposed in the 16th century. And so this very much predates Louis Pasteur. But it didn't, it didn't, there was no seedling, right? It, it didn't, it didn't sort of take root and hold and, and be become a real idea um, until the 1850s. And even after that, it was really the 1880s when anybody began to accept germ theory. And it was uh, miasma or miasma before that. And if you've had me in, in epidemiology, I spend a lot of time talking about Jon Snow and the overturning of, of miasma, this idea that, that uh, all illness, the communication of illness, these sort of vectors of spread, whether it's COVID or, or, or any type of illness, right? These, how this thing spreads um, is through scent, right? It's sort of the olfactory acquisition of, of illness. And so that was Jon Snow. Um, 1854 is, is really when he was, um, uh, that, that was the, uh, cholera outbreak in the Soho area of, of London, River Thames, right? So there's these two water companies. There's Lambeth, which is sort of clean-ish uh, water. It's not, it's not in the in the tideway of sewage. And, and then there's the, you don't need to know this stuff, so I'm just breezing by all of it. Uh, and then there's the uh, Southwark water company, which is like everyone's dumping their feces, not like booze into the River Thames. They're dumping like, you know, the shit house is just every, everything that comes out of their buttholes is going into the drinking water. And people thought like, well, at least it doesn't smell bad, right? My house doesn't smell bad. You know, we, we, we don't have, you know, functioning toilets, but, but we'll just like shit in the river. And then, and then the Southwark water company is going to get all that water and, and let us drink it. Um, and so everyone obviously gets cholera and everyone starts dying. And this is like horrible thing. And, and Jon Snow is the guy who figures out, no, it's, it's, it's the, it's what you're drinking, right? Is he, you put like feces water in your mouth and you're going to get cholera. That's how it spreads. It doesn't spread by smelling it. You know, like, ooh, that, like, like a fart is not going to give somebody cholera. Um, and he did the mathematical modeling of all this. And that's the foundation of epidemiology. But he, all, he went to the grave. I mean, he went to the grave with everybody thinking he was a fool. Right now, eventually, as I said, with, with all good ideas, uh, everyone eventually says, oh, that was my idea all along. But, but uh, I mean, he was just lambasted to the grave. Um, and eventually the world caught up with him and germ theory was sort of established and everything. But, but Louis Pasteur, we're still pretty much uh, pre-germ theory. And he did a lot of the, this, this legwork in, in metabolism of figuring out that it is, um, you, you, can, you can provide different uh, substrates and elicit different products, right? So there are microorganisms that depending on what you feed them, you're going to elicit some sort of, some sort of product here. You feed it a substrate and, and get, a, get a different molecule. And this is not um, alcohol or bust, Right, this is all metabolism really works that way. And so that's Louis Pasteur's that these microorganisms, they really are uh, little alchemists that, that, that alcohol is a form of alchemy in terms of the language as well. Al, you know, Arabic word for the, al means, just means the in, in, in Arabic. That's why you see so many Arabic words are al whatever, um, alcohol, Arabic word, alchemy. Uh, Arabic word, algebra, Arabic word. Um, so the kahal, like alcohol, I don't know what the alcohol means. But 
Uh, so, so alcohol, I mean, this is, this is, there really is a, a form of alchemy of taking one thing and, and converting it into another. And that's really the foundation of metabolism is, is this sort of alchemical activity of microorganisms. Um, and so that the foundation of, of metabolism, a lot of that is going to come from Louis Pasteur, but it's a summation of, of information. So lots of different drinks, right? The world and the frat house and the restaurant, the bar, whatever, different drinks all over the place. And my favorite that I've never actually had, but I, at, some, at some point I want to have the favorite narrative of, of a drink, the most interesting sounding one to me is Arag. Now you'll see it, it spelled A-Y-R-A-G uh, sometimes, or Kumis, K-U-M-I-S, is, is um, sort of the rest of, of, in other cultures, right? So other, other than Mongolia, where we're looking at some other cultures, or we'll call it Kumis. Um, but, but the milking of a mare, right? There, there's horse milk has a lot of fermentable uh, lactose and the, the season with which, this is a great book and I, I will break it down here in just a second. Um, but the, the, the season to milk a mare, to, to, to crawl down under a horse and start you know, tugging out some little um, you know, fluid is from June to October. And apparently a single mare, one, one of these horses, one of these you know, woman horses, a lady horse can, can produce a thousand, maybe 1200 uh, liters of milk in, in one season. And they give about half of that milk to the little babies and, and booze for the rest. You know, let's, let's air rag, let's, let's convert the rest into, into, you know, booze or whatever, just, you know, the milk. So the, but the, the Mongols, they, they milk yaks, they milk camels. This is a really suspicious looking camel. It looks a little bit like a, a sea world, like it's, it's flaccid fin syndrome for a camel hump flaccid hump syndrome. So here we have our ARAG right here, mare's milk. And, you know, page 70, like I, in this book, right? Mongolian milk animals. In this section, I examine more closely characteristics of the milk produced by each animal and, and provide some cultural background, including descriptions of the traditional methods of, that, uh, of animal husbandry. Horses, page 74, right? It takes considerable skill to milk a mare. <laughs> Favorite line in the book. I, I didn't read the whole thing, but... Um, no matter the source, right? You can make booze from milk. You can make it from grapes. You can make it from honey. You can make it from barley. You can, I mean, this is where we get all these different forms of alcohols. You just take a different form of food and allow it to ferment, allow yeast to work on this substrate, on this food, whatever it is. And suddenly you have a different name for your alcohol. You know, is it yak milk? Is it barley? Is it grapes? What is it? And then we get our transmutation, right? We get our alchemy. We, we get our alcohol from that. Now, alcohol itself, carbon compound uh, with a little OH on it and a little carbon compound, right? So this is, this is not like fat, you know, you have like an icosanoid. Uh, let's make something, a, a, a compound out of a arachidonic acid. That's a 20 carbon fat lives in your phospholipid bilayer, arachidonic acid, a prominent fatty acid in the phospholipid bilayer. 20 carbons there. Hey, alcohol, we're not having these big like 20 carbon chains on these things. Now, methanol, that's the one you don't want to drink. You don't want that in your mouth. Um, ethanol, that's the one you do want to drink. Uh, and, I mean, unless you don't want to drink. But if, if you plan to have alcohol in your mouth and then in your throat and then in your stomach and then in your blood and then across the blood brain barrier and then metabolize, if you want that experience with alcohol, ethanol, is, is the one you want. You want the two carbon version of this, a butanol, you don't want that. You, you, certainly, I mean, these are, these are the versions you don't want. Now, the prefixes, right, the suffixes, um, chemical structures, that's all this stuff uh, implies, but any all, right, ethanol, right, the hydroxyl group, that OH group, the hydroxyl group, that's all that means. If, they, if it ends in an all, uh, methanol and ethanol, you know, a little bit different functional group. There's the hydroxyl group right there. Now you'll see this in other compounds, um, acetic acid. And so that's in vinegar. Um, what gives vinegar its vinegar taste is acetic acid. Um, and you'll see that OH in it. Cholesterol, 
right? A steroid alcohol, cholesterol, alcohol. Oh, what's this? This is our little OH over here. And so our steroid hormones, um, we're seeing uh, these, these similar functions. So the steroid, alcohol, cholesterol. Remember cholesterol, people for some reason think cholesterol is fat. Fat is a, like a carbon string. Fat and cholesterol are like nothing alike. They just like have nothing to do with each other. Um, or do they live in the same place sometimes? Sure, right? but are they the same thing? They're not even almost nearly close. They're like so far apart from what they are. Um, but cholesterol, this, this steroid alcohol. Um, the different chemical structures, right? The, the primary, the secondary, the tertiary, it's just where the hydroxyl group uh, is attached. So for the primary carbon, we have this primary alcohol. Um, secondary, it's bound to a secondary carbon. Um, and then for the, for the tertiary, right, we have this saturated version of it. I'm not going to ask anything like that on a test. But again, ethanol, that's the one you want to drink. That's the one that you see in, in alcohols, especially better alcohols. You go to Smart or, or um, whatever that like huge alcohol store is, um, whatever, there's one on, on Pacific Ave. Uh, Bevmo. Bevmo. Yeah. You go to you go to Bevmo and and there's expensive alcohol and there's cheap alcohol. Now some of this is marketing, but some of it is what comes off the still. You know, you're gonna get methanol in there. There's gonna be some little amount of methanol. You want the bulk of it to be ethanol. Ideally, you want it all to be ethanol, but um, but what comes off the still pretty early is is going to be uh, methanol. And then if you don't want to waste any alcohol, they yeah, just throw it all in there. Like I poisonous, whatever, who cares? This is just like four people drinking it. That's sort of the, the philosophy. That's not my philosophy. That's the, clearly the philosophy of alcohol manufacturers. And it determines some of the some of the price differences. Now, William Faulkner may or may not have said civilization begins with distillation. I have not verified, verified that. He's cited as saying this, but often people are cited with saying things I mean, especially famous people um, are cited with, with saying things they never said. And Einstein has like a thousand quotations assigned to him um, that like, you know, the definition of insanity or whatever that like yeah, he has now mouth never shaped those words. Um, but people just want it to be repeated. And so Einstein's head, whatever. So, but let's just say William Faulkner said this. Maybe he did. Civilization begins with distillation. It's a, it's a good line because... 10,000 years ago or so, 9, 10, 11,000 years ago, we're seeing various cultures, remember Iran, Iraq, Turkey, and we're seeing it in, in, in France and in China. So it, we're seeing all of these different cultures making alcohol without really knowing it, just fermentation, getting involved in, in, in fermentation, distillation, maybe 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago or so, and, and just... Um, uh, distilled water. Remember, water is kind of poisonous for, for most of human history. You're just going to get dysentery. And, and so the distillation of water, but the distillation of alcohol uh, as well. And it may be another thousand years before that. Uh, let's go 3,000 years ago and we get a really primitive uh, understanding of, of, of distillation and you know, read the tablets and, and descriptions of distillation in Mesopotamia. So maybe, okay, but let's say a couple of thousand years ago, 2000 years ago or so, we're starting to see distillation and, and we see civilization being erected, kind of, kind of expanding and, and, you know, taking over the globe and, and, and the sort of rise of whether it's the arts and, and you know, religion and, and all, all of civilization really mounts at about the same time as, as distillation. So it's, it's a reasonable line. I am not gonna hold anyone accountable for it. It's just an interesting anecdote is all it is. But with distillation, what happens is we, we are losing molecules, right? We're, we are, we are uh, losing some of these molecules. Uh, they, they, they leap into the air above it. So if you look at like the bubbles in champagne, the bubbles in beer, that's carbon dioxide, right? But if you're boiling something, those bubbles, the bubbles in a, in a boiling liquid are a gas that were once that liquid. Um, 
And so you get enough motion in these things and, and, and they can burst free and kind of leap into the air above it. We get evaporation, similar to sweating, right? In a leap into the air above it. So when you heat the liquid though, you're heating this liquid, you energize those molecules, you increase the departure of these things and ethanol, uh, much more volatile than water, you are going to leap the ethanol out first more of those uh, ethanol molecules are going to transition to that gas phase. Um, let's leave water to behind and let's emigrate from this from this vat. Um, that's what ethanol is doing. So that's what distillation is, is separating the ethanol uh, from the water. Um, you know, vaporizing this, the alcohol vaporizes, right? Leaves the water behind and you collect what vaporizes. Uh, there's a, a zeotrope though is, is a is a uh, a liquid and a and, and a vapor that have the same composition. So an azeotropic limit would be. I don't care how much more you know uh, distillation you attempt to do here. I don't care how much more you know distilling you're doing. It's the composition isn't changing, right? The vapor that's coming up has the same composition as the fluid that it's that it's emigrating from. And so for alcohol via distillation, the highest alcohol percent that you can possibly get is 95.57%. You cannot get 95.58% alcohol. That doesn't exist through distillation. That's not a process by which you can get 95.58% alcohol. You get to here and the vapor and the fluid have the exact same uh, ethanol uh, uh, composition. So when you see stuff like this, 96%, okay, clearly they're rounding up. Otherwise they're just barely lying because that's not something that happens. Right, that's that's you know above the zeotropic limit, and so we you know what the total percentage is. But when you see the word proof over here, this word proof, one hundred and ninety-two proof. What is what does that mean? Right, one hundred and ninety-two proof. It depends where you are. And today, the use of the word proof, no matter where you are in the world, is just stupid. Just report the alcohol percentage. Originally, the definition of proof was kind of cool. It was interesting. And there was a taxation that went with it. And, and there was an interesting you know, test that involved gunpowder. But the US definition is, they're both really, they're comparably stupid today. But in, in the US, you just double the, the alcohol by volume, whatever that, you know, if it's 50% alcohol, then it's 100 proof. 20% alcohol, it's 40 proof. I mean, that's stupid because it's the same amount of information. What, what that's like saying is um, every time someone asks you for a price, you report that price in both dollars and yen. Like, well, just, I, I'll do the conversion if I need to. But, but, you know, like, I, I'm at the mall in Stockton and you're telling me the price in both dollars and yen I, or, or whatever, you know, rupees or something. I, I'll pull out Google and whatever translate it if, if I need to. Um, that's what the, the proof doesn't tell you anything else. Um, the UK definition of a, of 100 proof is 57.15% uh, alcohol by volume. Um, but the original definition of proof, 16th century. And this one is sort of fascinating because what they do is the, is the, the gunpowder test. Pour gunpowder into rum and light it, ignite this thing. And if it lights, if it ignites, then that's pretty, the word proof means test. Right? It doesn't mean like irrefutable evidence or anything like that. The word proof literally means test. So if somebody says, oh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Yeah, the test of the pudding is eating it or proving grounds, that's testing grounds. The exception proves the rule. That would be insane gibberish if proof meant, you know, confirms, right? The exception confirms the rule. Are you insane? What is the matter with you? Um, proof, the word literally means test. And so Proof, we're testing the alcohol. 
um, you know, the exception tests the rules is what that means, obviously. <clears throat> so let's test the alcohol. Let, let's let's prove this and pour some gunpowder in there. And if it lights, all right, we have 57.15% alcohol or higher, and that thing is going to light. Um, now, I don't know how precise this was. It was probably a pretty crude thing that people were doing, like how much gunpowder is in here. The story itself, the narrative itself is wonderful, and it gives a great definition of proof. And you tax it at a higher rate uh, if it does light. You know, it's A, this is this provides um, evidence, this thing lit, this provides evidence that the alcohol is high enough that I want to drink it. I don't, I don't want to like sip watered down rum, but also um, it's taxed at a higher rate. So the best um, merchant or, or, or whatever, the, the most economical alcohol, the most profitable alcohol would be 57.14% alcohol so like oh we just we had we, we we proved it we tested it and it didn't light on fire we're taxed at a lower rate but right at that limit that would be the most economical uh version of alcohol but the uk definition now is just like it's four sevenths it's just sort of a stupid thing um so to the uk proof just alcohol by volume <clears throat> times seven fourths and so that's just a, a more difficult uh calculation than let's double it right but it doesn't like oh, okay i don't know this just doesn't this is sort of gibberish. Um, the original definition was cool, though. I, I like that one. So <clears throat> methanol, this comes out of the still first. You remember distillation? We're going to have these molecules leaping out. And, and we have that azeotropic limit. But, but, but well before we reach that, we're going to get some ethanol uh, leaving the water. But we're going to get methanol jumping out of there first, very early out of the still. We're getting some methanol. So that's a really poorly made alcohol. You know, yeah, like everybody has some story of like, oh, my neighbor's friend or whatever, um, you know, was making his own beer and they ended up in the hospital. And I was like, okay, probably they're just, they had no idea what they were doing. They're drinking a bunch of methanol. Um, what you want is ethanol. The middle part of the distillation, that's what you want in your glass. You really don't want the end where it's, you know, 95% alcohol. That's, that's not what you want. Um, Oh, you know, yeah, this is this is 95.57% alcohol. Okay, that, that's causes like damage to your esophagus. Uh, you want what's coming out of the middle of the still, not the early, right? I don't want to be poisoned. And I don't want to have like alcohol damage. Of, I mean, I don't want to like burn up my esophagus. And so if you, if you remember when we were talking about testing your core body temperature through urine. You want the middle of the of the urine spray. You don't want to get right what comes out of it for the first you know eighth of a second. You want to test that. You want to test the last little drip that comes. You want to get the middle of the urine stream. Yeah, same thing with what's coming out of the still. Let's get the middle of the stream of what's coming out of the still. Okay, now transitioning, I'm not gonna hold you accountable to any of that stuff. That's just let's set the scene. Everybody has an experience with alcohol. Everybody, most people have ongoing experiences with alcohol. Most people have both good and terrible experiences with alcohol. And it's nice to set the scene and say, here's the, a little history and, and the scenario of what it is that we're putting in our mouths. Now, once you put it in your mouth, where does it go? What happens? What are the mechanisms of breakdown? What are the explanations of the buzz? And that's the stuff that I'm, I'm going to hold you accountable for. So this was all preamble, getting into the physiology, which is once you drink, ideally it's ethanol, but we'll talk about drinking methanol on, on Friday. Once you drink ethanol, well, what where does it go? Where does this thing go? Now, it's a little tiny molecule. Remember, fat is like huge. Fat can't cross the blood-brain barrier. Alcohol can. The blood-brain barrier, remember, that's the hypothalamus lives behind that thing. And the pituitary lives out in circulation, right? But they're separated by the blood-brain barrier, this permeable but selectively permeable barrier that's separating circulation, the systemic blood flow from the extracellular fluids in your central nervous system. So the, the fluids that are you know, bathing your neurons, you know, the, the extracellular uh, fluid in your central nervous system, that's protected from uh, the contents of your blood, solutes that are, that are 
you know, dissolved in your blood. Uh, pathogens that may be sailing around, hiding in your in your blood. Um, hydrophilic molecules that are that have a have set up shop in your blood. All of these things, they are not going to cross the blood brain barrier. Ethanol, that'll hop right across. That'll hop right across. It'll get into the brain, and once in your brain. Um, at least 100 receptors, probably a lot more, right? a bit, but more than 100 receptors that it can bind to. And is going to begin affecting, um, uh, modulating communication between neurons. Now, neurotransmitters are transmitting information. This is how one neuron communicates with the next. It's not doing like Morse code, like tapping, on, on the next neuron, right? There's these neurotransmitters and some of them um, are excitatory. They facilitate communication. We have excitatory neurotransmitters, glutamate, right? B big one in the CNS. And then we have inhibitory neurotransmitters, GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid, GABA. And a lot of what we see with ethanol, there seems to be a lot of GABAergic activity um, of GABA uh, interactions. And, and I, people are learning, you know, day by day, month by month, year by year, decade by decade. People are learning how alcohol exerts its effects, but there is today there remains a degree of magic of sort of you know harry potter lee magic uh in in how alcohol exerts all of its uh effects but gaba seems to be um one of the primary uh, interactions that alcohol has and there's there are some maybes associated with this though but inhibition of the of the um, prefrontal uh, cortex and the temporal uh, cortex and so we're looking at memory you get like wasted and memory oh I don't remember anything from yesterday a lot of the time I think that's just an excuse for like we do embarrassing things like oh my god I don't want to be the type of person who did that I'm just gonna pretend I don't remember it um so I think there there's a degree of of pretend uh, memory composition, but then there's there's a, a degree of, of reality of like, no, I truly don't remember what the hell happened yesterday. Will you walk me step by step through what insane things I did to wind up missing a leg? Whatever. Uh, and so there, there, there can be memory effects. Uh, motor cortex, everybody knows this is an effect, the cerebellum. Now, the cerebellum, this is fascinating. There are studies about um, why do we like 4-4 four, four music? Why is all pop music 4-4? Four, four? Now go like jazz, go like Dave Brubeck or something like that, and you get interesting timing signatures. Um, get into uh, 90s grunge or something, like uh, Soundgarden or something like that. You get weird timing signatures, or like Tool or whatever that band, whatever, weird timing signatures. But get on the radio, get on the radio, and there's like dance music, there's you know anything from you know, get in the 80s with like Madonna and Tears for Fears and, and whatever, and then get to like 90s, early 2000s with whatever, Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera and stuff, and then get to like Bieber and whatever comes after Bieber. I have no idea. It's all 4-4. It's all, and, but we have this efficient metabolism with, with you know, in the motor cortex where what, what is going on with, with, why do we find these beats pleasurable well just watch like birds in long flight or, or a horse in gallop or whatever and and there's an efficient stride or wing beats and and you can explore these domains and find some sort of pleasure center um in in efficient metabolism and consistent beats as opposed to just weird galloping techniques and stuff. And there's more to explore. I'm doing a very bad summary of this, but but when we start to compromise some of this stuff with, with alcohol, you can see it. Just watch a really drunk person walk the straight line, right? Watch a really drunk person tap their foot to the 4-4 music. You know, we, we start to inhibit some of this stuff. However much we still like the dance club, right? The discotheque or whatever, uh, we, we, we lose a lot of that that uh, function, that motor function. And that's part of the reason 
eight lectures ago or something, half a dozen lectures ago, when I said, you know, what's a way to cure some of this compromised motor function in the presence of pain? Because we experience an injury, we experience pain, we experience some pathology that, that alters our neuromuscular recruitment characteristics, whether that's in the low back, whether that's like rotator cuff stuff, um, we experience an injury and our motor coordination changes. We start using the wrong muscles to accomplish a task that should have been used by um, you know, some deep postural muscle and now we're using like a superficial heave muscle to do it. And like, do we get through that same movement? Can we exert with the same force? Sure. Are we using the correct musculature to do so? Probably not. Uh, and so alcohol, I said that maybe this is a remedy. Let's just get drunk and, and have Genevieve do our yoga session. Like, let's go to every Genevieve, you lead yoga, you stay sober, everyone else is drunk. So you'll have a terrible time, but all of your clients, subjects, participants, whatever, are going to be loving it. And uh, you can probably work around some injuries because you're intervening with the cerebellum, you're intervening with motor activity, probably, there's, there's probably therapy there to be considered. Um, but we also get this elevated HPA axis stuff. And you know the HPA axis, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. The hypothalamus is going to release corticotropin releasing hormone, right? This is our stress response. It also gets you out of bed in the morning. It's not just like, you know, the, the velociraptor, those tiny and unthreatening in real life. Uh, the T-Rex is in your backyard and you two are in your backyard, whatever. Um, so, but the, the stress response and natural biological rhythms of let's get out of bed in the morning, but alcohol, you're going to increase that HPA activity. The pituitary gland is going to re release adrenocorticotropic uh, hormone, and then you're going to get to your kidneys. You're going to get to the adrenal glands, the adrenal cortex, and <laughs> Jennifer, I'm looking at a comment. Wow, not fair. Uh, so you get to the adrenal cortex, and the adrenal cortex releases cortisol, and so you will get a little bit more of this activity um, with alcohol. Now, you put this alcohol in, and you have to get rid of it just like everything else, you don't keep it. You're not a hoarder. You don't put it in the bank. You don't collect interest on it. You don't just, uh, this isn't like, okay, you know what? I got a storage shed for, for alcohol. Let me just keep it there for a while. We metabolize things. And so we convert one thing into the next, right? It's the, the biology is the great alchemist of the world. We, we convert one thing into the next. And for alcohol, the way we dispose of this at first, alcohol dehydrogenase. Now I'll talk about the different forms of, uh, you know, methanol, the, the differences here, but with alcohol dehydrogenase, you, you present ethanol to it, to alcohol dehydrogenase, and you convert it into acetaldehyde. You convert it into this little guy right here. Now dehydrogen ACE, remember an ACE is going to be an enzyme. Any ACE is going, an A-S-E ACE is going to be an enzyme. Um, a dehydrogen ACE, right? We're transferring away that hydrogen and you have a bunch in your stomach and in your liver and we're facilitating the breakdown of this thing. There are five classes of this that are known, um, but you're stripping the, the hydrogens, right? Dehydrogenase, dehydrogen ACE. And there's other enzymes as well that if in the presence of excesses of alcohol, um, let's say you are Princess Leia, this is, I don't know, this is like a too soon situation or, or, or something, but um, I read her book, uh, Postcards from the Edge or Ledge or From Beyond the Edge or what, whatever it was where, where um, <clears throat> she, she, she was a decent writer and had some nice little points and stuff. Um, about alcoholism, right, or addiction and alcoholism. So uh, if you have alcoholism or just excesses of consumption that, that you say, like, I can stop anytime I want or whatever, like, oh, okay, whatever. Um, then we're looking at some other uh, molecules that are helping deal with this. But for the most part, we're talking about alcohol dehydrogenase, dehydrogen ACE enzyme. So we're getting rid of the hydrogen. So D whatever, dehumidify. What are you doing? You're getting rid of humidity. Right? Let's, dry, let's dry this stuff out. Um, destabilize, right? We're, we're removing stability, right? Degrade, let's remove your grade, your rank, whatever. Dethrone, no, death, D-E-F, right? That's not a, you know, like, well, I'm getting rid of my F. Like that's, that's not a thing. But D usually means like remove. And so dehydrogenase, let's, let's transfer these hydrogens. Um, 
<clears throat> so that's all this. We convert it into acetaldehyde. And then we have acetaldehyde dehydrogenase uh, to dispose of the acetaldehyde. When that, um, when the acetaldehyde dehydrogenase does this dehydrogenase, um, on the acetaldehyde, we convert it into acetic acid. And earlier, I, I, I said that acetic acid is what gives vinegar its vinegary taste. Vinegar is diluted acetic acid. It's not toxic. So this is how we dispose of our ethanol, convert it into vinegar, right? We take our acetaldehyde and, and, and convert it into vinegar. Now, throughout life, and during life acutely, right now, right, that we have a man and a woman. Let's say we have, let's not put Nathaniel in this because Nathaniel is going to be an exception with both, um, you know, total body dimensions. I mean, he's like as tall as the moon and, and, and has a, enough consumption to have, have developed. Tolerance is the wrong word. There's an adaptation, it's not mere tolerance. But, um, but let's just take two people who've never, you know, had alcohol before and, and you have a man and a woman. Usually the male is going to metabolize it a little bit faster if they drink the same amount of alcohol. Um, the guy is probably going to have more total lean tissue, but even in identical body weights, uh, we're going to see um, the, the male metabolizing a little bit more. Often you'll see more alcohol dehydrogenase in the in the stomach of a male. And so you're going to start to break down that alcohol. And so that's what people talk about when they say tolerance. As you get older, you are less tolerant of alcohol. This is a little picture of Paul McCartney, right? A beetle this is a picture of one of the surviving beetles. And it, and and when he was in his youth over here, and there's like you know, screaming teenagers at every show, um, he could probably metabolize a lot of alcohol something closer to today, Paul McCartney, he's not going to be able to metabolize quite as much. Um, what happens is his, his as, as anybody ages, males age, females age, the characteristics of alcohol dehydrogenase, right? You lose that, that concentration. You, you um, have less of a tolerance. Don't take this as like a sexist. You become more feminine and tolerance. That's just the presentation. As, as a male is a little bit older, um, you do have uh, it's almost as though um, there's a gender reassignment in one's stomach, you know, and, and of alcohol dehydrogenase. Um, you're producing less of this. Now, um, the more you drink, the more alcohol dehydrogenase in your stomach you can, you can you know, build up and you can start to uh, metabolize that alcohol really before it has a major effect. So depending on the, the person's drinking history, you can see uh, some amount of, there's an adaptation. Again, it's not tolerance. It's like, well, I have the same buzz, but I'm better at, at performing in my buzz. You are, you are converting it into acetaldehyde at, a, at an elevated rate. Um, and so what we have is, is differences in metabolism in part are genetic though. It's not just males and females. There are genetic lineages where if you have flesh syndrome, sometimes called Asian flush or flush syndrome, East Asian populations commonly um, get flushed when they drink out, there's like their faces get red. Now, in the cold physiology section, when I was talking about responses, biological responses to the cold and when you drink alcohol, part of what happens is blood pressure, um, blood distribution regulation gets a little bit haywire. Uh, acetaldehyde, right? Acetaldehyde is partly responsible for, all right, let's send a bunch of blood to the surface. And that's bad if it's cold outside because you're going to exchange heat with the cold environment. Your hot blood is, is surrendering its heat to the cold environment immediately outside of your skin. And in, in certain populations, right, we have this wonderful version of alcohol dehydrogenase great version of alcohol dehydrogenase. So let's, let's just hustle ourselves over to acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. Okay, now we have a crappy version of that. We have a crappy version of that. And let's hang on to that acetaldehyde for a little bit. And it's, it's the, the appearance of, of like somebody drinking in the cold. Like somebody who's like boozing it up in the in the snowy winter, and so that's what flush syndrome would be is is a good version of of alcohol dehydrogenase and a, a crap version of acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. And so you hang on to the acetaldehyde, you don't convert it to vinegar just yet. 
you'll get there, but you're going to get a little bit flushed in the meantime. That's what flush syndrome is for those who have it. Um, now, this is the adaptation piece I was just mentioning a minute ago, where when you're a freshman, oh, the freshman 15, you gain 15 pounds by, you know, boozing it up all, you know, whatever. And uh, you're going to develop more um, uh, alcohol dehydrogenase, you're going to be able to metabolize more of this alcohol. It's going to take you more and more drinks to get that same triumphant buzz. And then you get to the point where it's like, mom, my stomach is all distended. I just can't drink. Like, it's like the milk challenge and I'm not drunk yet. And at that point, um, you, you probably have an adaptation that has happened, um, which allows you to metabolize more of this. Now there's um, functional and metabolic effects. So pharmacodynamic being functional and um, pharmacokinetic being uh, metabolic effects. Um, so just changes in the functional or, or pharmacodynamic is uh, the cell's response to alcohol. You present a cell alcohol and how does it respond? To that alcohol. That's the functional pharmacodynamic stuff. Uh, the pharmacokinetic or metabolic is the breakdown and the clearance of alcohol. And this is just a bunch of enzymes. And so we have these dehydrogenases and other alcohol metabolizing systems. I mentioned that one earlier. When I was talking about Princess Leia uh, and you know postcards from the edge or, or whatever and, and people who have a lot of drinking are, are going to rely on some other stuff so that the metabolic p uh, part is is clearing it and if you specificity of adaptation if you want to get really good at metabolizing alcohol give yourself a bunch of alcohol to metabolize yeah specificity of adaptation let's go back to lecture number two or whatever um and, and you can be your you know beer pong legend and stuff but if you do this for a really long time and you wind up with liver damage the liver is a wonderful organ oh in part because it gives us the bulk of our igf and insulin like growth factor is wonderful for you know recovery and and regeneration and athletic performance and and um, IGF even has you know neural roles and it's wonderful IGF and that's where we're getting most of it from our from our liver but also the liver one of the cool parts about it for which it has long been called the noble organ um, heals heals phenomenally that liver is a healer best healer in the body I mean if you're going to have organ damage somewhere heal uh injure that liver that thing's gonna come back i mean you know the this is this is gonna sound cruel callous cold whatever but just go with it because it's a good analogy i think it's a good analogy maybe that makes me cruel um there's a dog that's just devoted and loyal and it kind of pants at your feet and, and and brings you newspaper and stuff and you kick it okay and the dog is like hey, and it runs away for a second and then it comes right back and it starts it starts you know tomorrow it brings you the paper again and you kick it and the dog whimpers and whatever goes away. And tomorrow it's back at your feet and it's licking your calves and, and it's excited to get you the newspaper again. That's the liver. But there's a point at which you kick it too many times. There's a point at which you kick it too hard that the dog doesn't come back. There's no newspaper at your feet. There's no dog saliva on your calf. There's a point at which it doesn't come back. But it's going to come back with its, with its love intact quite a lot. That's what the liver does. Uh, the kidney's an okay healer. Most stuff is shitty healers, right? Especially into like a central nervous system. It's a mess to try to heal any of that stuff. But the liver, wonderful healer until you kick it too hard. And then it becomes a horrible disaster. And if you expose yourself to drugs, you know, anything you put in your mouth, first pass hepatic metabolism, first stop is the liver. You swallow something and where it's going to go is the liver first. Um, and so if it's like, you know, a, a steroid hormone, you know, if you're going to take prednisone, you're going to take estrogen, you're going to take testosterone, something like that, you take it by mouth, it goes to the liver first. And so that's why oral anabolic steroids are like horrible for your lipids and the liver controls your lipids. Um, you'll get the opposite effect with estrogen. And, and, but the, the liver is the first place all this stuff goes. You drink a bunch of alcohol, you're going to send it to the liver, and you can't metabolize it very well anymore if you destroy your liver. Um, your, your alcohol metabolism, I mean, you're just going to be drunk for days if, if you really mess up your liver. Looks like he's cold <laughs> and his lips there. Okay. We didn't go too far over, a little bit over. What questions do we have?
So not too much testable content there. I'm, I'll do just like last time. I'm gonna I'm going to start over with those recap sequences and and. Uh, so there will be some metabolism stuff at the beginning of the recap sequence. Things to pay attention to, things to assign uh, keener focus to as you as you um, start preparing for the final. Uh, but not too much from today. We'll talk more alcohol metabolism physiology interactions on Friday. Is that us for today? All right, go get out of here. I'll see you in a couple of days.